Hello, 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 uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Expert to Authority show. This is the co show for coaches, speakers, and trainers who want to grow their businesses while making an impact in the world. And today we are going to talk about how gener to generate high ticket clients with live events. Uh, our guest, uh, Paul Fink, is the maverick millionaire, is one of the most uh, and the foremost authorities in business and personal development today. Uh, in his over three decades of sales, marketing, and entrepreneurial experience, Paul has moved over $20 million in real estate transactions, sold over $30 million in informational products, and run over 250 live events. He's worked with some of the best known speakers in the world to take their events to the next level and coach entrepreneurs and small business owners from around the world to build their business and create an abundant future for them all. Paul, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I am doing awesome. Great to see you. How's everything going on your end? Uh, in exotic London, all is good. That's it. That is <laughs> London. Love it. In exotic London, all is good. But uh, So before we get started, we are going to talk about live events and getting high ticket clients from live events. You have tons of experience in this field. So yeah. I cannot wait to dive deeper in there. But before we start talking about live events, tell me a bit more about, uh, you know, what do you do these days? Uh, what your fo Where is your focus? Uh, um, and let's start from there. Like, tell us a bit more about you and your yeah. business. I'll, I'll tell you some of my quick background and the thumbnail of how I got here. Uh, I have been an entrepreneur since I graduated from college, went right into straight commission sales. I was in the medical field, the dental field for about 15 years and then kept moving forward in other industries. The cornerstone is uh, almost four decades now of hardcore sales, consultative selling experience. And that's where I started. And then I went and went on because uh, uh, we haven't talked about uh, my family, but uh, I've got six children, three sets of twins. Damn. So, so with that, um, that was a catalyst to learn how to step my game up and create even more in my world. And so my youngest is 21 years old. We had six kids under six years old, 21, 22, and 27 now. And 20 years ago, then I had to figure out how to build wealth, how to create this magic. And I started taking real estate classes. Right. And so all the gurus out there started taking all the classes, built a fairly good sized portfolio in real estate. And then I'm listening to the people and somebody asked in the audience, like, how come you're teaching us? Uh, why are you speaking when you know everything about real estate? Why are you like up here speaking to us? And the guy told me something really profound, or at least I thought it was directly to me. He was talking to a room of like three, 400 people. And he said, do the math. <laughs> and he said, you know how much you paid to be here. And it was a fairly high end ticket price. And he said, do the math. Do, do you think that in one afternoon, one day, or even one weekend, you could be creating this kind of revenue? with everything that you do. And I can do this while I'm also doing real estate. I went, hmm, that sounds like a really good idea. Yep. And began to apply my skill sets into the speaker world. That was about 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. And started looking into what to do on the speaker world. I uh, got trained, that guy actually became my mentor, started working with him, expanded out, what learning the craft under his tutelage for about three years and then went off and created uh, my own stamp on the world, if you will, and been speaking now at this level for the last 16, uh, let's say 13 years at this level, coaching and training entrepreneurs all around the world on how to create more in their, in their life. And one yeah. of the verticals that I talk on is how to create a magic in the live event space, how to be a coach, a speaker, a trainer, and make actually more than minimum wage, uh, which is one of the challenges that happens. Uh, mm -hmm. And we see it all the time. And so you want to be a coach. Sounds great. Only you have to learn business and yeah. what's the model of doing it. And so teach that on, on 
how to scale, how to create sustainable income in, in the coaching world and how to really build a multi six figure into seven figure income. Which I got to say, if anyone, uh, if you want to go, all the informations are in the show notes. You can go and visit mavericoffer.com. Uh, you can scroll down uh, if you're listening uh, uh, to the podcast. Uh, you can scroll down. There is a link to go to maverickoffer.com. So if you're interested in knowing more as well throughout this interview, make sure you visit maverickoffer.com. Um, Paul, I, I have a question for you because uh, uh, I come from the same background, and, uh, which is uh, speak to sell, selling from the stage, creating right. seminars. Uh, GTEx is uh, 10 years old. My company is 10 years old this year. And we started with live events. But I remember the first time I sold and uh, I sold properly. I had a room with about 100 people and uh, I made no sale. I sucked so bad <laughs> that, man, if I, I, if I could just swallow in under a hole or something... It was one of the worst experiences of my life, but I'm glad I went through it and I built this skill that I believe is uh, the ticket to financial freedom. You know, you, you learn how to sell from the stage, whether it's a live presentation, a virtual presentation, that's your ticket to financial freedom. Yes. Um, f- how was your first time for you selling uh, at an event? Ooh. So so I'll tell you my background. So I entered the speaker world. I, I was uh, 2007. So here is 2007, I have a long history of running business and being in sales, but never from a stage. Matter of fact, I was scared to death. Like if I got into a room of five, 10 people, my throat would close up, my hands would sweat, I'd start shaking. I I was a mess. I, the first time I was on stage, fortunately, my mentor didn't give me a microphone. Uh, so he knew that I was scared to death and just introduced me, said, yeah, go speak to Paul Fink in the back of the room. And uh, and I went upstairs kind of on stage, waved and then went off stage. Right. Yeah. Over the next few months, he put me on stage like every month. I stood up there and eventually I got up the guts to say my name on microphone and then to say a few things about myself. And then so it was a desensitization process. Hmm. Now, fast forward. Now it's a year later and I have a couple different stories, one of which is the first time he put me on stage for 10 minutes to speak on stage Mm -hmm. and I lost my voice. I said, I've got laryngitis. He said, it's psychosomatic. I went, no way I'm sick. He put me on stage anyway. God bless his soul. He put me on stage anyway and I squeak through it. So for any of you that think you're, this isn't a position for you because of one excuse or another, Mm -hmm. trust me, We've all been there and gliding, guiding examples is Simon and I about where we've been because this definitely wasn't our, our place, if you will. We learned how to do it. Yeah, 100%. And uh, it, it's fascinating to see how then uh, a lot of people then uh, make it look effortless. effortless. You know, I th- I'm sure that people see you now and they say, oh, Paul, but it's so effortless for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> you haven't seen my first one. <laughs> So fast forward my first, so that was a 10 minute spot he put me on. Then he put and said, oh, I've got a two day spot. I want you to do the city and I won't go into the city. You'll just do the whole thing. And I had like six weeks notice that this was going to happen. Well, for about three out of the six, I figured out how I could basically hurt myself so I wouldn't have to show up. Um, that's how scared I was. You know, I'd be driving down the highway going, all right, if I just turn left, (laughs) I wouldn't have to show up and be on stage. And so understand that's where we started. The first time I sold my own product on stage, uh, the person, there was a person in the room that is still by my side now. And that was 13, almost 14 years ago that I was selling my product from stage. I sold it from stage. I got off the stage. No one bought. And I had a couple friends in the audience that were from the speaker world, and they all cringed as I walked off the stage. Like, ah! Because I was a, a, they described me as uh, as a general barking orders from the stage. 
go do this now, right? And, and scared the bejeebus out of everybody yeah. in the room. And the only one guy bought later on that day, only because he had knew me from before. And he talked to me in the back of the room about exactly what the product was. And I was able to create one sale out of it, but it definitely wasn't from speaking on stage. So let, let's talk about what works, because from your experience, you have seen what works and what doesn't. So yes. let's start with uh, some, of, um, the, so, some of the things that you find that works well for people that want to sell from the stage. They want to create events or seminars uh, when right. they are selling their offers. So one of the things that, that you want to keep in mind, and there's a couple of great components in this. One is as you're planning an event, all too often, and I'd have clients, I ran a speaker support business for about 10 years where I consulted with speaker, speakers or wannabe speakers, people that had boot camps and people that didn't. Oh, and they were running, they were going to have a boot camp and I was going to coordinate all the sales. And I'd ask them, the first question was, well, what's your goal of the event? Like out of the event, what do you want to get out of it? And the answers range from, oh, I want to deliver my message or I already sold this. So this is a fulfillment event. And so I've got to have it to take care of my clients that already paid me. Um, nine times out of 10, the answer was not what it needed to be. And that was to create profits for my business. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're doing a transaction, you can have multiple goals in the transaction. However, to do something as major as an event and, and not have anyone in the room focused on, oh, we've got to end up with profits at the end of the day. That's where most people go sideways. Yeah. So they end up, oh, they build this great community. They build a great feeling. Everyone's rah-rah and excited, but they forget that all this costs them a ton of money and they've got to actually pay for it in some way or they're not going to be able to do it again. And so make sure that as you roll into the event, that you understand where your profit centers are and have done the math that at the end of the day, you're actually going to make a dollar. It doesn't have to be tons, but you got to make a dollar at the end of the day or you're not going to be able to do it again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I can definitely relate with the, that concern of not wanting to sell at an event, because I think that sometimes I definitely thought about that many times uh, is okay. Well, either this is a fulfillment event or I don't want to look too pushy or I don't want to look too salesy. I don't want people to feel that I'm selling every time they step into a room with me. And, and I had that. And then only to then after the event, post event, doing the aftermath, then to regret it because I'm like, damn, but <laughs> this is not sustainable. Um, right. And because uh, live events, they, they have physical costs. They cost money to run, and they're not cheap. They're no. not cheap if you if you want to do them well. Um, so, building on this, uh, when you're selling a product or when you're selling a service from the stage, what have you found uh, that uh, works well to get people to buy? Uh, to say, "Oh yes, I'm gonna do this. Right. I'm gonna do this now," instead of mm, "Let me think about it" or I'm not going to do it at all. Right. So there's a couple of techniques. And one of the things that I learned over the years is I was really good. And I learned consultative selling one-on-one. -on -one. And I would always engage one-on-one -on -one and put move people through a process of, of why do you want what you want? What's your dream? What's your vision of where you want to go? Once you know where they want to go, then, well, how do you, what's your game plan now to get there? How's that working? Mm -hmm. Once you know, oh, what they're doing now isn't getting them to where they want to go. Well, what do you need to get you to where you want to go? And then your product or service can be plugged in to help them go from point A to point Z. That's a one-on-one -on -one process where mm -hmm. I screwed up when I first got started was I thought the stage was different. It doesn't have to be. And so understanding that you are talking one to one and even when the audience is more than one person, 
you still must talk one to one. And so first lesson is as a speaker, talk in the singular, not in the plural. Absolutely talk to, talk to your audience. So a hundred, a thousand people, it does not matter as if it's one person. Imagine that person in front of you and talk to them about what are your dreams? Not all of you, think about your dreams and what are they today? No, what are your dreams? What are, what's your future look like? What do you want for tomorrow? What have you been doing to get there? And you're talking singular. What happens is the people really feel it and they yeah. feel like you're talking directly to them and the rest of the world disappears, which is what you want because now you can actually engage with them human to human, emotion to emotion, rather than when you talk in the plural, they look to their left, look to their right, because they know you're talking about them, not about, about someone else, not about them. Does that make sense? So it, talk- it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I, I love it because uh, I think there is there can be sometimes the tendency of forgetting that you're having conversations one on one, and definitely I made this mistake more than many times, many many times, and sometimes I still do. Um, is that reminder of actually you're having a conversation one on one. You're asking singular questions and you're getting people to reflect on their situation. So now you are using what works in a consultative selling approach uh, or the similar questions or the same question that you will ask. Well, that's what I'm hearing you saying. The same question that you would ask on a, same, on a sales consultation, you ask them from the stage. Correct. Now, instead of the conversation being a 20-minute or half-hour conversation, maybe a 10-minute conversation one-on-one, you now can expand that conversation over one day, two days, or even three days. And so understand that an event is one continuous conversation from the moment you open the doors, actually from the moment before you open the doors, before they even get to the room with your communication online and inviting them to the room, all the way to to the moment that they leave or even beyond. It's one continuous conversation. So how did you greet them when they came to the event? What is your what do you do in the hallway at the registration table? How are you engaging them in conversation, getting them ready to even enter the room? Because it's all about building a connection, building a, a community, building that continuous conversation where, oh, this is where I'm supposed to talk about my dreams, my desires. This is where I'm supposed to go to figure out what's next for me. This is, this is the place. And the only time that they feel that is when they feel connected to you. And how do you make that happen? Talk one-on-one, talk about real things that they're going through. And then, then there's a, a couple other components. One is you got to believe in your product and your service. You got to believe in what you're selling. You, you don't believe, neither will they. So you've got to believe at a deep level that what you're offering to them is the best darn deal, the best darn offer, the best darn service, the best darn product they could possibly find and believe that at a deep level because that's going to translate. It'll also translate when you don't and they're going to feel that emotion. And so your fear will translate to their fear and they'll run. So absolutely stand up, be confident, talk to a singular person and talk with conviction that what you're offering to them is amazing. Prior to getting to that step, you're going to have objections that you already plan out. And what I would say is any objection you've ever heard before you get on stage, write down your top five objections. And then write down your answer to each one of those objections if you're talking to somebody one-on-one. Well, the top five that you've heard, what do you answer to them? What's the real argument, if you will, to their objection that would move them forward in your your process to buy your product or service? And then put those objections, put that conversation hours before you ever get into your sales process Hmm. long before they're ever talking about sales talk about, Oh, well imagine this. I remember when I was in the crossroads and 
I had uh, another another opportunity where I had got to invest in myself. And I'm like, I've already invested in myself all these years. Like, I don't need to be spending more money. I need to get a return on investment on what I had. Mm-hmm. And I remember being in that space and not knowing I had more, somebody that was asking me to invest more in myself. And man, I was like, why would I do that? And what I realized is, is that all that stuff that I already invested in didn't serve me. I could pull it off the shelf. I could get it. I could attempt to build up my emotions around it again. Only the reality is, is that I didn't feel any emotional pull to pull those books off the shelf to go hang out in that with that information again. I wanted something different that would pull me emotionally. And when I did that, when I took that next opportunity, invested myself in that next thing, that was the thing that catapulted me to everything I have today. Be careful about getting yourself stuck or stopped in the process. And I'll tell that story. Well, I'll tell that a day before we ever get into the sales process. Because you know it's coming up. You know that uh, there are a lot of people there. They already invest in other programs and they will have in their mind, let me get a return before I do something else. Right. So we already know that's a heavy rock and a heavy objection. Face it long before. So it doesn't feel salesy. It doesn't feel like you're like telling them, listen, you got to buy today because of that. It feels like, which it truly is, I'm telling about my journey and what I experienced. True stories, only you face that and you tell those long before it comes up as a salesy process. I I want to recap uh, some of the things that you said, because one is about asking questions personally. So always talking to one person, always talking to you, using some of the same question that you would ask uh, in a sales conversation one-to-one, but move them into your presentation and then see that in the context of the entire event. So it's not about squishing them in one short space of time where you're bombarding them with all the answer to the objections, with the pitch of the product, with the questions and so on. But if you're running the one day, a multi-day event is throughout the event, then being passionate and absolutely convinced about your offer and then also uh, preempt uh, all the objections that they come up and put them as part of your presentations, not uh, before you're actually selling. So then uh, when you're in the moment to sell, then you don't have to address them um, right. after. Uh, and right. they know already the answer in their mind. And I think that just in this point, if people would do this, it will make a, a huge, huge difference in huge. their conversion. Um, I want to ask you, I want to ask you something though. Um, is there... You know, sometimes when we are running events, um, we can have an idea, which is a very creative idea on a sales or marketing level that is like, oh my God, this was a game changer. Either very few people do it or I'm really proud of it or, oh my God, this was just like made a big difference. Do you have something that you've done throughout these 250 events that you made like this small adjustment? You had this maybe like last minute idea and it make a big difference. Under, it, here's one. And there have been several along the years. When, when you have so many and you've gone through the same process, when you're doing so many events, it's a constant growth and tweak along yeah. the way going, all right, you learn, you learn, you tweak, you tweak, and get better and better. Our conversions now are some of the best in the industry. Because I went through that process, I know this is what works. And we've got systems and processes that are fine-tuned. And and that's what I teach to so many of our clients is here's what you do. There's a model. There's a formula. So be clear. uh, So one of the things that I did was um, I'm a firm believer in in understanding profiles and personality profiles Mm -hmm. and assessments and understanding that there's different people in the audience that you're marketing and selling to. Well, one group of people are high analytics in your group, and they were probably my most difficult to sell to. Like I I connect with the ones who bottom line results oriented, the enthusiastic, you know, fun loving salesperson type. I could sell to them and engage with them on a personal level. My coaching and consulting and my background in clinical psychology, I connected with the socially conscious uh, people in the audience. 
the analytics are where there was a little bit of a disconnect for me. Mm -hmm. I did a deep dive and, uh, and over a couple of years got really focused in on what they respond to. And one of the things is that an ad, someone who's deep analytic, your engineers, your accountants of the world, your IT people of the world, they're slower processors. Mm-hmm. And this isn't to criticize that that's how they go through very analytical and methodical in how they process. Well, if you're doing a sale over a three day event and you introduce the sale in the last day in the last hours of the event that's any significant decision that whole group is never buying yeah never ever ever and so then it's like all right so i'll do the sale in the morning uh sunday morning if it's a friday saturday and sunday i'll do it sunday morning that way they have all day not good enough i did it saturday afternoon still i found that i would do that it i wasn't connecting I started introducing a major sale, the major dollar amount on Saturday before lunch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When I did, and, and here it was, wasn't, it wasn't about manipulation. It's not about you know, controlling them. It's about understanding how they process and give them the respect of giving them the tools that they need to make their decision in enough time frame so that they actually could based on how they want to process, not how I want them to process. Yeah. And understanding that where you're looking to serve people on their terms, not yours, and segment your audience as to who's there and how you can serve them best. So for an analytic, giving them the information, giving them all the tools, multiple meals and the night's sleep before they had to make a final decision was instrumental in moving them and helping them make decisions before the end of the weekend. And it increased, that's another 10, 20% increase in your bottom line just because of that one tweak. That's major when you're selling high ticket sales. Uh, have, you, have you ever tried to do the, the offer on the first day if you're doing like a three day? I usually do. I, I haven't and I usually will do. And, and kind of I pull back the curtain and tell exactly what happens. All of you that come to my three day boot camp, you can come and hang out and watch this is a model of what can what works and i offer it up to all coaches and speakers come watch the model of what works wearing that hat while you're also learning and receiving yeah. but wear the hat of i'm a coach analyzing how another coach is doing this and so we've done we do a lower end package on the first day kind of seeding the room okay. with a sale and so we ramp up some people ramp down we ramp up. So what I mean by that, for those people that are just learning some of these techniques, a ramp up means I start with a low sale, move to a medium sale and then end with a high sale ticket price. With a ramp down, some people start with a high price and then they'll seed the audience to, well, if you don't like that, here's a thousand dollar offer. If you don't like that, here's a hundred dollar offer. You don't like that, here's a five dollar offer. And then they'll work they'll do descending order of their sales process over the three days. And, and there's not a right or wrong with that. It's depending mm-hmm. on how you want, where you want the major part of your audience to end up. Yes. And what your major sale is, where you want it to be in the, in the process. For me, our high end masterminding is really our, our reason for being, for running the events is introducing them to a high ticket item. Yeah. And so we do a ramp up rather than a ramp down. Uh, I I really like it um, because there are different schools of thought. You know, the first one is if you're going the ramp down, right. you, you are thinking that you're looking at, okay, who in the room is already committed to play the higher level right. and then going down because there is the thinking is like, is also for price anchoring, everything else will sound cheaper right, or more affordable. But on the other side, you can prime people from buying with something easy to buy which mean, which is a, like the most difficult dollar is the first one that they spend. So then makes it easier the second sale. And for everyone that likes to geek out on events like me and you, then it's yeah. something worth testing. I'll tell you something that I'm doing that I really love and it got us a lot of sales even in virtual events is to include an assessment as part of the sales process. So every attendee is, uh, completes an assessment yes. uh, based on our model. I don't know if you ever if you ever experimented with that. Oh, absolutely. 
almost every model I've experimented with right, as right. or another in my career. So the assessments, do you give it online or do you have it? Um, Depends if the event is on a, is a virtual or in person. But so ideally, they, I want that. Uh, I want that online to do the the, the assessment right. online, and then we send them a personalized recommendation. And then when we have the conversation for the one to one sales, then we go back with the assessment, and the sales becomes way more personalized. Right. That's so, uh, that's I found works really well, really really well. Yeah, absolutely. And we played with with that as well. And there's a few systems out there now that are doing that really well. And uh, that we've been playing around with and we're, we've implemented partly in mm -hmm. what we've done. Um, and yes, we can geek out on this. For all of you, uh, I want you to get that I ran speaker support for 10 years while I was building up my own client, my own business and coaching. And um, in analyzing, one of the great benefits of doing so many events is that I begin, I've been able to analyze the numbers and analyze on an analytical basis. All right, here's what we did. Here is the results. Selling a high ticket item with a professional team. All right, now we go to another city, another room. Here's the here's what we did. Here are the results. And knowing what every dollar that was spent and how it was spent, how many people were in the room, what the actual dollars per head were, what the units that were sold, what the price points were, knowing what works and what doesn't in being able to analyze all that firsthand was so profound in what I've done in my events that we're able to, and the conversions at different levels. For instance, some of the systems that we just talked about with doing the assessments, mm -hmm. if you, when you have 30 to 50 people, that becomes less necessary. And when you have 30 to 50 people, when you have 30 to 50 people, the ramping up makes more sense. Mm -hmm. When you have a thousand people in the room, mm -hmm. ramping down is what I would normally yeah. recommend, which yeah. means you start with a higher ticket item and then you kind of. Uh, you, have, you have muted yourself. I think something happened and you, you have now, you're now mute. No, still on mute there. Let me see if I can unmute you. Uh, I says that your microphone is not connected. I think you knocked over your microphone while we were having the conversation. I don't know. That's something that happened. But anyway, while Paul is coming back um, here, uh, then uh, let me just uh, share something with you because uh, uh, to make a point of what Paul was saying, is the importance of testing and refining. Um, yeah, it looks like you're back. I still can't hear you, though. I still can't hear you, Paul. Let me see. How's if that? Can... Now, oh, yes. 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 Sorry about that, guys. I got so excited, I, I banged my own microphone. So <laughs> I got you. So My passion exceeds me. So <laughs> testing and refining through all those years, and understanding what works and what doesn't and understanding. So if we're doing larger events and what I was saying is you do a drop down of the sales process because now you can grab the cream of the crop with a high ticket offer and then clean up with a membership site with book sales and everything else. As you go through the last couple hours, or the last day of your event, giving them easy offers for everybody that wasn't really feeling of taking off the top and when you have a thousand people in the room that makes sense when you have 50 do a deep dive don't even offer the low ends do a deep dive and have real consultative engagement with them about conversations that really matter to them and you'll get a much higher um, engagement with them on the backside. love it love it i mean there is so much to learn from you paul so everyone uh, make sure you visit MavericOffer.com. Uh, again, the link is in the show notes. So it's MavericOffer.com, or the link is if you're watching on YouTube, is in the description. Uh, Paul, I have a, uh, two more questions before we wrap up. Shoot. Question number one is uh, What was a very unexpected event that you run? And when I say unexpected, I mean this 
I remember speaking at an event once and the organizer told me there were going to be 300 people. I went there and there were 30 people with and 15 were the speakers. Yeah. So I had uh, three of my team members coming down. I printed about 500 booklets and materials and so on. W probably we all, we're all familiar with this kind of situations. But it actually ended up being one of the most profitable events <laughs> that I've ever spoken because a lot of people end up buying on that. And I ended up in the next uh, like three to four months uh, getting a lot of high paying clients. What was an unexpected event that at the beginning you thought, oh, my God, this is not going to go well. And then it just proved, proved it wrong. Great question. And when you started that, all the all the thoughts in my head were was all the bad events. And so a couple of things I just want to share. One is for anyone in the speaker world, if you do not know already, people have a tendency to inflate numbers. So whenever you're being asked to speak and they tell you, oh, man, we're going to have 100 people in the room, assume it's going to be 50. Every time you speak, just cut the number in half. And you're, you'll manage your own expectations and you will do so much better. Every speaker, including myself, that have been through the test of time, we have ended up printing up, producing, creating, and going, jumping through hoops and spending tons of money and resources on events that say, oh man, there's going to be 500 people in the room and you print up for 500 and there's 50. It, it happens all the time. Yep. Learn to manage your expectations. So uh, one of my first events flew across the country. So 3,000 miles to get to the other side, only to get onto a stage that was supposed to be a month earlier, 1,000 people in the room. Then three weeks, 500, then two weeks, 200, et cetera, et cetera, until we had about 20 people in the room. So manage your expectations because the rest of the story is that I've seen speakers self-destruct. Because, Simon, like you said, you walked in there and it ended up being one of the best. What so many speakers do, and I teach about emotional intelligence and understanding how to control your emotions when you're in those situations. So many people lash out and they lose it because, oh, man, I was supposed to have 300 people and now it's only 50. And you end up berating or hurting the 50 people that are right in front of you mm -hmm. when they're the people you should be embracing because they actually showed up. And so how do you understand to hold on to your emotions to deliver the best? I've run a three-day boot camp with three people in the room, only two in the room at any one time. And I did every slide because I just show up regardless of who shows up on the other side. I show up the same way all the yeah. time. And that consistent, persistent behavior to hold your emotions. So one of the things that I've done is that and created the abundance. And so often I've had events where one of my early events, three-day boot camp, it was about a month before the boot camp. And we were all set. And my team tells me we've got two people registered. No. And... And then we didn't get any the following week. And they're like, you know, maybe we should just cancel. Maybe we should just quit. Maybe, you know, this isn't mm -hmm. the right time. I remember telling them, if I stop now, I'll never get back on the horse. If I, if I cancel yeah. this event, it'll be so much more difficult the next one. And one of the greatest things you can do is just stay the course. Plan what you're going to do and then follow the plan. Don't change course. And I just said, you, no one's allowed to talk about canceling anymore. Every, all hands on deck, we're putting, doing everything we can to put every person that we can into the seats. And we ended up having the event and creating profitability on the event. And that's happened every single time uh, having a profitable event. I've yeah. never lost money out of three day boot camp. So stay the course, continue moving forward, never say quit. And it's one of the greatest advice, go show up and watch what happens. Yeah, yeah. This is about the attitude that you have. It's about respecting, as you, have, you said, something that I, I absolutely love is about respecting the people that actually bother to show up. Yeah. They are there. Yeah. Right? If your mind is thinking about all the other people that actually are not there, that you don't even know, that you're not going to be able to connect with, 
stay right. there. And then you have a chat with the event organizer later. <laughs> After the event, then you debrief with the event. But even during the event, like you stay the course, you yes. stay professional because the event organizer will see it, other people will see it, and you never know it's going to be there in the room. You never know. Uh, my last question for you, Paul, before we wrap up. What has been your highlight so far of your speaking career? Uh, the one moment where you said... Not either I made it, but uh, it's like this is uh, this is a, as close to the top that I can get. So I've been on a lot of top level events. Uh, one is the what used to be called the Learning Annex is now the Wealth Expo. Dan, Tony Robbins all over the world. Uh, they've done world tours. I've been on that stage twice now as a speaker. I started in the audience with 30,000, 40,000 people in the audience. And I was able to do this. This was probably about five years ago. And it was full circle for me is to be on the stage and the stage where I bought everybody that was on that stage years earlier. And now I was the one on the stage. And that was yeah. that was really great. Just doing that full circle. However, the moment that really kicked in, I do high level retreats. And it's one of the things that I do with my mastermind. And with everything that I've done, I remember the first time I did a retreat and put it all together and we had an exotic uh location in a villa not, not london and not, not exotic london. london not london it wasn't exotic not exotic london <laughs> and it was it was like everything that was in my head my vision of what that would look like as i was on stage presenting it and selling it and moving everyone people to it and then all the months and getting everyone there and my wife was by my side and i remember we were walking back to our to our room in the villa the last night or the first night. And I remember turning to her and saying, I did it. I did it. I took what was in my head. I took the vision of the possibility and I made it into reality. That's key. That and whether it's on stage, whether it's the after effect of what happens when you're able to sell and effectively create whether it's any of your coaching moments with your clients, recognize that we build the life that we want. Make sure it's the life you want. Let's build it effectively. And coaching information marketing is one of the number one best ways to create abundance for yourself and to serve others all at the same time. Yeah, I, I have goosebumps. I can I can feel when you were saying that and the joy oh that you experience in that retreat. Uh, and thank you for ending on this note, because uh, as speakers, of course, we have our Mount Rushmore's of other speakers. We have our goals, things that we want to achieve, and they're different from every person. And sometimes they're unexpected. Sometimes we think that uh, sharing the stage with a big name can be the highlight, and then you organize the retreat. And that becomes, oh, my God, there is no better thing than that. Yeah. All right, Paul, we've got to wrap up. Uh, what can people expect when they go to maverickoffer.com? Uh, great question. MaverickOffer.com, they've got two things. One is I put together a multimedia um, ebook, if you will. It's got videos and training all on time management. One of the biggest challenges with entrepreneurs, and we're all entrepreneurs, running our own businesses is how to manage our time, get the best value out of the time that we spend, and really create a balanced life. All that and more in all my bits and pieces and tick tips and strategies on time management. In addition to that, you also will get an opportunity to get on my calendar and get a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me. It's something special. I, I have the ability to be able to do this for, uh, for all of you out there. And it's my pleasure. You want to understand what the next steps are for you. Get on my calendar. Let's get a, on a phone together and really talk turkey. Yes, it's me that gets on the phone with you. And yes, it's we're going to talk turkey. It's not a sales call. It's not about pushing you to a product. It's really talk about your next steps. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, maverickoffer.com. Make sure you visit. Paul, it has been a, a very uh, powerful interview. I uh, loved everything yeah. you shared. And uh, uh, if people just use one or two things of what they've learned here, they will be able to massively improve their conversion in events or even get started if they've not started it yet. Here so, all again, thank you very much. You're a superstar. 
Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. Re-listen to this podcast. You will absolutely get a ton out of what we shared. Magic stuff in there. All right, everyone. Thank you for watching or listening. And until next time, remember that together we grow exponentially. Ciao. Bye, guys.